London, which is probably not where you expected us to be. And we have got a lot of catching up to do. But first, bus. So welcome to Windsor. Mother Nature has welcomed us with the Arctic Blast this week. It's going to be very, very chilly. And we're in the UK because it turns out a lot of the boat parts for our HH44 are made right here, including the glass doors, the wenches, the hatches, and a bunch of other stuff. So we are on our way to go visit the HH factory, believe it or not. But, uh, you know, we're taking the long route because we've applied for our visas, we've got some time to kill, and why not? That's, that's why we're here in the UK. I apologize. I'm not very steady with the camera already, but it is cold, so I'm like. <laughs> it's gonna be a great, great uh, video. Yeah, we weren't expecting it to be quite this cold. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know Windsor Castle, it's actually one of the royal family's residence, one of many, and it was built in the 11th century, so it's pretty old. This is like a super historic area, beautiful place to uh, walk around and be a tourist. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Fortunately, I think it's closed. Well, we can still look. We got in late last night and we had given ourselves one day to acclimate, kind of get used to the time zone and to the weather and everything else. And I don't think we quite realized how much we were gonna need that because we slept until noon. Worst jet lag ever. <laughs> oh my gosh, shocked us. We like woke up, looked at the clock and I was like, wow. Anyway, half our day is already gone, which it's okay, it's what, what it's for. So kind of just walking around, soaking it in, taking it easy so that we will be somewhat in the right mind for all the things that are ahead. We are going to give you a boat update because while we've given you one in a really long time and we've got lots to update you on. Well, today and then tomorrow is a whole nother day with <laughs> whole new adventures. I know, but <laughs> tomorrow, you know, I'm, always just, a different day. I'm just saying that that's not all, this, this entire video is not just today. There will be multiple days. goes the river boat. Won't be much longer and then we'll be on a boat like that. Ah, ah. Giving secrets away. Dropping hints, dropping hints. So boat update. It's been a while and I know there's been a lot of questions and we've made a crap load of choices in the past couple months. She's coming along as it really starting to look like a boat. We've got the coach roof. The outside structurally is all together. So and she actually looks like a boat, which is cool. Yes, and she's looking beautiful. And then hole number one is of course even further along, which kind of gives us a little sneak peek at kind of what to look forward to. And right now, one of the reasons that we're here is because of the windows, like the sliding glass doors, the safari windows, that is all made here in the UK. And as you all know, windows are a bit of a sore point for us. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons we wanted to get educated and kind of learn quite a bit more about that process. So that's kind of what's gonna be happening next at the factory because Right now, everything structurally is there and they're starting to work on the interior. They're finishing the hull, so like all the priming. All the sanding <sighs> is being done. It's just an insane amount of man hours. And we made the big choice a couple weeks ago and we finally decided we are going with paint. Yes. So I know there's a big debate. We asked everybody <laughs> about paint or gel coat. And from our experience, trying to match gel coat is pretty damn difficult anyway. So paint. Might as well is, match paint. In theory, it's supposed to be five years or more of not having to do much to it. And that yeah, sounds like, like a dream. Don't touch it. Like you just leave it alone for the first five years or so. And then of course you want to get like maybe a clear coat or like, but no actual waxing or buffing. No buffing. No buffing, and I am very happy about that. <laughs> so, so we're kind of going for less maintenance. 
course, we'll report we'll back in five years. Yeah, it's to see how that works. But we feel like we saw Ticket to Ride, yeah. and they were four, four years in, and they still looked great, and they hadn't done anything to there. So they were just like starting to get to points where they were thinking about like, we might we do another wax. Yeah, even yeah. if it's just like a little quick, like clear coat hand job, yeah. then that would work. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it alone. Uh, <laughs> Leave it. So if you're wondering the color, yes. uh, we'll just show you yeah. right here. We felt like our color choices were fairly limited because we did not want to do a custom color because then if you ever have a scratch, which let's just be honest, there will eventually be one, yeah. maybe more than one, <laughs> then matching that and being able to touch it up would be more difficult. As to where if we just went with like a stock color from the paint company, then it makes it easier because then you can get that color anywhere in the world or it's easy for them to ship it out to you. So that's kind of the theory behind that. And we decided, that's kind of a gone with the wind's blue. Yeah. Feels so like, I don't know. I feel like we should be more excited. <laughs> this is the chill. It's, I think my smile is frozen on. Yeah. And also it's just a bit stiff standing here. So, but I don't know, we were going to go into a cafe, but then we're like, it's going to be loud in a cafe. It feels weird to talk to your camera in, in the middle of just a big, a, busy cafe. This, yeah. But also just standing here in the middle of the street. It's not that weird. That's only a little weird. <laughs> At least we're in like tour zone, so everybody else has got their cameras on doing the same thing. All right, so we are in Havent at the Lippert factory. Lippert probably means nothing to you unless you own an RV, then you might know Lippert because they make like slide mechanisms and hatches and windows and all sorts of things, but there's a whole brand, well, lots of brands that are under Lippert, Lumar being one of them, just one of them. So they make a lot of stuff. In other words, a lot of our boat parts are here, literally here. And so we're going to be seeing them, learning how to maintain them. It's basically, it's school. We're going to school. That's what we're doing today. Europeans were building ships long before America was founded, so it should be no surprise that one of the world's leading marine equipment manufacturers is here. And all things considered, Lumar is but a wee babe that started back in 1946 by making dinghy fittings. And to say that they've grown over the years would be an understatement. Okay, now full disclosure before we get too far into this, Lippert is sponsoring several of the parts on our boat and they did invite us here, but it all started with one individual, which is Jim. So he is the reason that we are here today, mostly because he is a patron, a fellow sailor and a fellow Texan, and he is, well, planning for your dream boat, right? And that's kind of yes. what I'm brought excited. you to our channel. When I wanted to get something to do in the future, me and my wife and we just love sailing now. It's only been about six years since we started. Us too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've taken lessons. Now we're out sailing on our own, doing charters, and it's been a blast. What's kind of at the top of your list for what you think maybe you might end up in? We want something that's larger on the larger size. What's so large to you? Because large to some 50 people. 50 foot. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're looking at 48 being our shortest and maybe a 51 or a 55. And of course we're gonna buy used. We would like to either be a privilege or maybe an Outremer. We like the light wind. Yeah. We don't really want speed, but the light wind sailing could be important to us also. Yeah, but, so you're looking for something not too heavy that'll move right, through the water. That's yeah. right. All right, so basically if you've got a privilege for sale out there and it's in the 50 foot range, <laughs> give them all or yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. well thanks so much for well i guess getting us here because yeah. jim works for lippert mm -hmm. and how long have you worked for the company almost seven years lippert recently yeah. acquired lumar yes how long ago yeah. four years ago we also own tailor made we want to be in the marine space we're really excited about it we want to continue to grow in that space we are off to the races right away we're on a bit of schedule today there's a lot of different things going on so this is like their big showroom which we aren't going to get to see right this second because we are headed off to the south factory correct, correct. <laughs> for glass for glass hey you all know us and windows mm -hmm. bit of a thing <laughs> you both look best here very interesting this is the best there's the glasses, those are pretty cool. But nothing beats the overshoes. I am steel toed. You can run me over with a forklift, I'll be fine. Probably not, but 
That made good footage. <laughs> Understood. Do not push the red button. Yeah. The chances are, if you have a boat, you probably already know about Lumar because they make seemingly everything but the hull. Winches, hydraulics, windlasses, anchors, thrusters, hatches, port lights, blocks. They make their blocks in-house. So it starts off as this, then it goes to this piece here, then eventually to this. And the way this works is, let me see if I can get it right. Hey, this is a deck block. And that all happens. Right here on this machine behind me, it does like 30 pieces at a time. Crazy, right? They make travelers, cars, clutches, and cleats, and the list goes on and on. It's all way more than we can possibly see in a day, much less cram into one video. So we've decided to start today with one of our biggest pain points, windows. We have two serious issues, and the biggest by far is the windows delaminating. And the most daunting because it's a lot of freaking work. Is it's the one thing over the years that has caused us more money, blood, sweat, and tears than just about anything else. By the time I get this in, I'm gonna be professional. You can hire my services for a thousand dollars an hour because I don't want to ever do this again. Because our old boat had frameless windows with complex curves that made them difficult to install, remove, and eventually replace. Put too much curve on it. It's hard down here. It's got a hell of a lot of, a lot of curve. In front of it. Oh. You don't think your boat's got that much curve in it? Oh no. But thankfully, our HH44 has a completely different design with Lumar toughened glass that should last us a lifetime. I need some of the glass is 15 millimeters thick, and you tap it with a hammer rather than break it. So it's the only time you're allowed to use a hammer on glass? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And these guys are very, very skilled at it. So we're just pulling up the program in the machine right now. You can see everything's part number controlled. So nothing moves in Luma without a part number and a drawing because we have so many parts. Yeah. We have to have control. All the windows start right here on this scoring machine with a big, fresh sheet of glass. Like a uh, CNC machine, but for glass. Yeah, so it's a CNC process. And now we're going to go into the breakout phase. <laughs> it's like a bed of air underneath, which is why it kind of, it, so it's like air hockey. That's why the glass moves around so smoothly. But that tap with a hammer, I mean, it's like one tiny little tap and the whole thing goes. Very impressive. He was saying that if the guy is stressed, if you like put him under pressure, then I guess the tap isn't quite right and then the glass won't break right. So I said, you know, you've got to be kind of loose and relaxed to be able to do this very efficiently. And then he put the extras over in the recycle bin. So that gets tumbled and turned right back into more products. So there's no waste, which is very cool. The next thing that's gonna happen to that is it's gonna go to grinding. Glass here has been positioned on these suckers and that allows the grinding wheels to come around and put the edge profile on. So this is the uh, grinding wheel. Got a, a rough cut that'll take the initial roughness off of the edge and then a, a polishing. So this is actually a erosion process like sanding rather than a cutting process. So when it comes off of the cutting table, the edges are really sharp, apparently. It looks kind of marbled, like it might not be that bad, but they said if you run your hand across it, it's gonna slice you to pieces. So then that's why it comes over here and gets smoothed out and rounded off. So now you can touch it, run your hand across it, no problem. This is the printing room. The glass has to have a black board around the edge so that when it's bonded into the boat, the UV light can't get to the adhesive. So this printer is basically a ginormous bubble jet printer wow. and it's printing a photograph which is a black border onto the edge of the glass. Okay, now hold on. This is a point of contingency. The adhesive, isn't that now just adhering to the paint instead of to the okay. window? So this is a ceramic ink. So, so it's not just like a cryolon paint? No, this is a ceramic ink. So we'll put it, it'll be applied here. Some lights on the machine will dry it, but that is only a touch dry. And when it goes into the toughening oven, at 700 degrees, it fires that ceramic ink into the glass in a very similar way to if you're doing pottery. Okay. So the, uh, the glass and the ink actually become a single homogenous material. Okay, so then if you're doing, whether it was Perspex or this toughened glass, 
you still would not recommend like a cryolon paint on the outside of that. Pers Perspex is a bit of a different situation. Perspex, or to use the other name, acrylic, yeah. is a different, different situation. Because Perspex is a brand, acrylic is a product. Yeah. Got it. But Perspex has tissue a tissue Kleenex. Yeah, exactly. Perspex has got a softening temperature of about 80 degrees. So if we put it into the toughening hundred oven at 700 degrees, we're not going to fire the ink in, we're going to destroy the, the whole thing. Okay. Um, so Perspex has to be, or acrylic has to be done in a different way. Interesting. I'm just asking because like whenever we go to replace windows, there's always this big debate of you need that black border, yeah. right, for protection. Mm. But what should that border be made out of whenever you're working with like an acrylic? Because, yeah, yeah you're, you're worried it'll just chip right off. So the, the easy way to get around that is to actually put, when you're working with acrylic, is to put the, the black border on the outside so that you bond direct for, to the adhesive direct to the inside of the acrylic and obviously you prepare that surface with some some abrasion and so on first. Okay, that is the first time I've ever heard that tip, but that makes way more sense and I don't know why we never thought of that either, but I will take it. So there you go, we should have put the border on the outside. Yeah. Okay, so this is interesting because obviously that would be similar to like RHH because there will be spots that are just up against the hole. Mm -hmm. and so that's what's yeah. essentially what you're painting. There's quite large areas blacked out and only a small aperture on the window and that is because the boat designers are using the windows to put the styling signatures on. Boats are essentially a really large lump of white fiberglass and there's only so many elements fitted onto that that they can use to give a distinctive look and the windows are a big part of that and therefore every window on every boat model tends to be a, a custom shape to try and generate that styling. So this one's just come off the printer. Yes, if I was to scrape it with my fingernail, the ink would scrape off. It's only touch dry right now. It needs to be fired in, which will be the next process. They're going to toughen some glass, which requires this gigantic oven. So I hear it's about to get loud. Ha uh ha, -huh, I hear. Uh -huh. Ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. A clean sheet of glass goes in and the rollers inside keep it moving to ensure even heating and then spits it out into the cooling chamber where hundreds of little pipes quickly dissipate the heat, which is sort of like a big kid's easy bake oven. It bakes like magic with two ordinary light bulbs and has a special cooling chamber. Easy Bake by Kenner. Except this oven operates at almost 1300 degrees, which isn't hot enough to melt the glass, but would easily turn lead or aluminum into a puddle. Oh my gosh, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but it came out flaming, literally flaming red. I did not, I don't know why I didn't expect that, but that was some hot glass. All right, toughened glass, quality control check. Here we go. Woo. Okay, another little learning moment here. Turns out the toughened glass isn't all created equal. There's different types and what we have along the hole is different from like what our big safari windows and our big sliding glass doors will be. So explain to me, because there's a laminated and a monolithic. So the monolithic is a, a single pane of glass and if it shatters it goes into thousands of little pieces, each about one centimeter square. So it can give you some light scratches, but it, it's gonna be nice and safe. But if you broke the window on the boat, it's gone. Yeah. But we don't want that in hull. In hull is now a really fashionable place to have the glazing. So we need something with extra safety in that location. And the reason being is because we don't want, like if, if something happened or it had an impact, you wouldn't want that shatter and all just go away. You'd want to be away. able to just kind of still get to where you need to go with a, with a window intact. Yeah, so we, so we laminate the glass. We stick two panels of glass together and there is a, an interlayer, a plastic interlayer between them. And that interlayer holds the glass together if it's shattered. You won't see through it anymore, no. but at least you still have a solid piece that would still work just yeah. fine. And that, yeah. So in other words, if you were mid-passage, you'd be fine for days on end. Like, it's not an emergency to get that replaced. It's more you just can't see you've, through it. You've got some time to work with. Yeah. If I broke one on passage and I was in the middle of the Atlantic, I'd be having a little think about what my next plan would be. Right. Because it's not as strong as it was before. Right, but um, it's still in but peace. You, but you haven't got a boat which is flooding. Yeah. That's your first point, your boat's all yeah. intact. So that's what they're doing for the hull for yeah. fairly obvious reasons. So, so why not do that for like all the, the big salon windows? So that's, 
that could be done for the big salon windows, particularly if they're flat. It's normally an expense and weight okay. thing. So, so weight there's a weight penalty as price. well. Yeah. And what would you say? Like, is it like double the price, or is it twenty to thirty percent? Three, uh, three or four times the price. So it goes up quite considerably. Yeah, I'm good with just the, the tough and glass. <laughs> yeah. So they gave me the spring-loaded punch because they said if they gave me a hammer, I. I'd be still going at it and nothing would have happened. Like, the, it's that tough. See, now I want you to give me another piece and let me go out with a hammer. I feel like that's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this glass is toughened. Yeah. But not laminated. Not laminated. This would be like our safari window. This would be like your safari window. Yeah. Okay. Whoa. So how hard do I have to go to actually break it? Uh, I'm not sure. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Wow. You had to go out of a some gusto though. Yeah, and you can see the very fine break yeah. pattern, which is exactly what we're looking for. And you'll do this as a quality control. We'll do this as a quality control. So what we're actually measuring when we do this is the size of the, uh, the little pieces. Um, if they're too big, the oven and the temperature control hasn't been right. Does this pass or fail? How is this? This is a pass. This is good. Okay. It's less of the like little squares. Up here, it's like long shards. You can see where it's radiating out from, yeah. the, uh, from the point of impact. We'd be looking at down here and we're seeing less than one centimeter square. So that looks pretty good to me. Yeah, that was fun. Let's do more. <laughs> So this is, we're talking about how winches are made. That's correct, yeah. Right, okay. So effectively, all, all of the machine shops here are, are fundamentally based around our winches. So every single part from the bases, the stems, the spindles, the gears, are all manufactured in-house. So there's minimal parts that are actually purchased parts on the winch. It's all manufactured in-house. Take us through so, where we start and where we end. So one of the main fundamental parts of a winch is the center stem. So it then goes through operation one goes to operation two so you can see the difference of the two stems there so it has all of these diameters turned and all of the bores inside turned as well and then after that they move on to this stage here where all of the all of the holes are put in the threads the cutouts and all of the mounting holes for all the essential spindles so after that we have finishing stages so if i show you over here okay so you said it, it goes for a rumble that's correct yeah so the this machine is a is a rumbling machine we literally put the parts in the machine shapes itself and they go in there for around eight to twelve minutes per cycle and then that takes any sharp edges and bears off the material it, it's almost just like a polishing effect effectively yeah yeah which has these bearings put inside there that will get fixed into the machine and that'll get stamped into the machine so that's what the bearings run on and so there's a different person at every single one of those stages no. No, it's all no, one, it's person. One, one person runs all five machines. So. Wow, okay, but even still, like how long does that process take from start to finish just for this one piece? Uh, around six minutes, start to finish. By the time we've started running the first one, we'll then be running the next one and the next one and so on and so on. So right. if you had to build one, it would be six minutes. But by the time you've accumulated all of the processes together, that machine will be running whilst that one's running and then it'll be doing this. So, so you've got lots of cuts, lots ongoing at the same time. It is, but that's still like six minutes and it's just one piece. one piece of this process. You know, like for me as the consumer, I go to buy my winch and I'm like, golly, why are these things so expensive, you know? I'm like, I got 10 grand in winches. But then it's like when you think about the time and the effort and, that's, yeah, and the materials yeah. and I'm like six minutes for one piece. So it's like it really does take a lot to finally get to a finished winch. Yeah, exactly like yeah there's a lot of engineering involved in in getting it from a from a raw casting in, into this stage so. i mean that's kind of nuts it's probably one of the only products that we we've tried to outsource it we, we can't it's it, this will remain in-house for indefinitely because it's just that particular yeah if you get an error, like if you've got an imperfection in the metal, yeah. the whole system's going to go to foot, right? It's exactly that, yeah. If, if the process was in the wrong stage, that could cause fatigue and it could cause undue stress on the winch. We, we, we just don't know how it would react, so that's why it's checked at every stage of the process. If there's anything that looks abnormal or skewed, we, we just scrap the unit off. No, no, nothing will go through unless it's anything but perfect. Cool. Interesting is that they only run one material through each machine so that they can catch all of the shavings so that they can be sent off to be recycled. As to where if they were doing multiple different types of metal all in one bin, they can't separate that because it's too fine to be able to recycle it. So by dedicating each machine to each type of metal, it means they can recycle all the shavings. 
So the next stop is the R&D room, which should be pretty cool. This is a big, big winch. So this is an 88. Yeah, so we use up one full of our load testing in here up to, to around three and a half, four tons. Four tons? Just, just that particular one, yeah. There is a massive block over there. It's so big. In, in the world of custom, it's one of the small ones. That's, that's a big. small one, yeah. Just for reference, it's bigger than my hand. So this is a good spot to talk about power because she's converting a 24 volt thruster into a 48 volt thruster and our boat is 48 volts. The main battery bank is 48 volts so there's a lot of benefits to that but we also have things that are 12 volt so I kind of thought we should ask you. Can you introduce yourself? Yes of course. Hello. Nice to meet you. I'm Gabriela. I'm the senior electrical engineer here in Lima. Yes actually I'm working in this thruster for example. So the motor previously was a 24 yeah. and we changed completely the motor. Now this motor is a 40A. So of course we changed the motor controller to support the 40A, okay. but the control or the signals are carried on in 24. So this one is basically a hybrid system, okay. 40A to 24. And what's the benefit of going with a 48 versus a 24? 40A volts is ideal because if you keep the same load in the system, you need less worry because it's less amperage yeah. or less current. So that is the benefit of that, less copper, yeah. so cheaper. Thinner wires, lighter weight, less expensive. Exactly, and also it's more, more efficient. More efficient. Another thing to consider is our boat is built from the ground up to be 48 volts, so we can get a lot of the benefits with that 48 volt high draw products, but there's always things that have to be 12 volt, like our navigation can be 12 or 24, but NEMA, which is like the hub that everything goes through, is only 12 volt, as far as I know. It's kind of cutting edge, the 48 volt, and a lot of people, like Lumar, is trying to make things that are 48 volt, but you're still gonna have to have 12 volt, and I think our boat will end up having 12, 24, mm -hmm. and 48. But definitely 48 for the, the super high power, like heavy duty things. At the moment, the thruster is just going up and down. This one is a vertical thruster. The motor on the top runs the thrust here. So that one is 48 volts. This one is 24 volts, which is the motor running up and down. As the market it is, my suggestion is go into a hybrid system. Go into 48 to 12 volts. So you can run 48 volts into all your main equipment and you can run your 12 volt into your electronic. If you have NEMA 2K, electronic devices, PLC or you know whatever other, running into 12 or 24. Yeah. That will be the gray boat at the moment. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, we were supposed to go out on like their test boat so that we could, you know, see a lot of the products in action. But as you can tell, it is a beautiful UK day. <laughs> Rainy and gray. It's not always like this, but it's like this a lot. Lovely spring weather. Oh, okay, well, it's been a lot more than we ever, I think, anticipated. We kind of thought we would see some of the products and we obviously knew that we were coming to a factory. I just, it's so easy to underestimate how big and how much is always going on. And there was just a lot, but mostly just really impressed with everybody. It wasn't all just about a tour today. They set us down with the, all the designers and the engineers and essentially said, so we do these company wide and just started going through things and said, what do you dislike? Where are your pain points? What are you having trouble with? Let us know so we can improve it. Of course we were like, well, okay, you asked. But it was more than that. It was also like, what do you feel like is missing? Is there something you think that we could make that would be good for cruisers? So it was just really nice because it was like from the customer's perspective, you know, we want to improve things. We want to make things better. I feel like it, it hasn't always been that way with a lot of marine brands and i feel like some are doing a really good job of that it's been fun it's been it's been eye-opening how about you love i mean i'm always a sucker for a good factory tour it's just really really cool to see the guts of like what's going to be installed in our boat and uh all that you know and oh geez i mean <laughs> it's been a long day <laughs> my red eyes are probably showing pretty good and uh you know jet lag and all that stuff so well we're gonna call it a night yeah thank you so much for watching yep Bye. Should I, uh, should I oh, yeah. <laughs> you might want to leave this line. <laughs> I don't think we're going to use these. We're pretty good as rain boots.